All right, why don't we get started? Um, my name is Jim Wilgenbush. I'm the Associate Director of the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. Um, as, I, as I said, and I think uh, almost everyone might have heard, today is, is really about um, a general introduction uh, to the resources at uh, MSI. Um, you won't have to sort of follow along. Um, uh, the other tutorials that we have later this semester uh, definitely have a very strong component where you'll be given some sample data sets and you'll log into your account and you'll do that. You are more than welcome, however, to do that if you would like. If you have an MSI account, you can either log on via your laptop, probably the way you do um, at home or off-site, um, and follow along just as I'm, as I'm uh, sort of touching upon some of the resources that we have available, um, but it is not at all um, required. Um, just a general overview, uh, who we are, uh, where we're located, um, the resources that are available, who's eligible, how you get access, those are the things that we're going to cover. Um, everyone here has an account, so you probably already know that MSI is um, an academic unit. Um, we're actually part of the Office of the Vice President of Research. Um, why that's important is that uh, we're, we're not technically a service provider in the sense that we sort of get our operating budget from uh, this sort of general pool of funds that come uh, to the university through overhead. Um, so we get our funds uh, either directly through uh, the state as it, as it applies to the university um, or we um, get grants. Um, or collaborate on grants uh, with uh, many of your, your faculty advisors. Um, we have about uh, 42 full-time employees um, and um, a few sort of work-study students and some of those students you interact with um, at our sort of first level support. So if you had an issue, say, with your password or something like that and sent a message to help at msi.umn.edu, uh, they're the first sort of line of support. And they're undergraduate students, actually. And, and uh, the ones that we have with us now have been working with us for um, almost a year. Um, and as you might expect, they, they have a learning curve, too. And they're really actually, I think, getting uh, uh, very good at what they're, what they're doing. The uh, sort of support workflow works in such a way that uh, if the students can't answer your question immediately, which is often the case, they will move it on to sort of the next level. And that's where um, you'll be typically communicating with someone who has much more of a specialization in the area around which you're asking a question. Or if it's software related, it might be someone who really understands our software infrastructure and can, can decide whether or not this is something uh, that he, he can resolve. Um, as far as sort of scope of who we serve, uh, we actually have well over 600 user groups right now. And so that's kind of the way we arrange um, our, our users right now. They're typically under what we call a principal investigator, which might be your faculty advisor. And then that faculty advisor might have anywhere from one student, you, uh, to in some cases, literally hundreds of students for some of the big labs. And the unit, the PI, is important because the PI actually holds the um, sort of the monopoly money you could think of, monopoly money of computing, which we call SUs or service units. And so the PI group holds the SUs. If there are lots of people in your group, then you burn through a collection of SUs, uh, which might be as small as 70,000 or as large as 11 million SU hours. So that's about the variance that we have amongst our user groups. To give you a sense of, well, what does an SU mean? It actually maps directly to a CPU hour. And, and to give you a, a more sort of tangible sense of what sort of the minimum or the base allocation of 70,000 SUs is, it's basically um, a half of one of our nodes running nonstop for a full year. So one of our nodes um, has 24 cores. So it's 12 cores uh, on that node running from January 1st, 2017 
until December 30th. Come on in, don't worry. Um, uh, 2013, uh, uh, 2017, the, the following year. Um, so it's um, th that hopefully gives you a sense of sort of what those service units mean. Um, so it's basically 70,000 70 70, SUs, half of the node running nonstop. And then you could sort of scale that up in terms of thinking about how does someone possibly get to burn through 11 million SUs? Any idea how someone does that? Anyone here in computational chemistry? Right, so you, you should be able to tell me. <laughs> That's a bit, it's a big, I, I, I mentioned that group in particular because they're, they really consume a lot of um, CPU hours. So you can do it one of two ways, right? You can, you have to do it in parallel, first of all. And so you have to run lots of jobs simultaneously over numerous processors. And you could do that sort of at least in a coarse grain way in one of two ways. You could either write code using something like message passing that actually distributes a job over a bunch of nodes simultaneously or in parallel. Or you can create a job array, an array of different jobs that also run in parallel but don't necessarily communicate to one another. So these are the ways generally that people can can utilize lots and lots of SUs in a given year. Um, it's not always the use case. Some people are more sort of um, episodic in their use, um, and they're running a piece of code more interactively, uh, maybe doing some data exploration uh, interactively. Other people, are, again, are running these big batch jobs that might have parallel components associated with them. Uh, the current director is Claudia Newhouser. She also directs something that we call the research computing, um, research computing, and research computing essentially, I think uh, the next slide shows, has uh, three organizations. MSI is one of those organizations. So, but we also, research computing also houses the University of uh, Minnesota's Informatics Institute and also Uspatial. Has anyone used Uspatial before, by the way? Really cool, really cool service if you're doing anything having to do with sort of spatial data analysis. Uh, they have some tremendous resources, and I encourage you to check them out. Welcome. Just make yourself comfortable. There's lots of, lots of seats here. Um, yeah, by no, no problem at all. Um, and so, um, so the way that we're organized internally, just so that you get sort of a, a better view again of how we work, um, we're, we're divided up essentially into um, uh, five functional groups. This is just MSI now. So MSI is divided up into these five functional groups. Um, three of the groups within MSI are what we call solutions groups. And the solutions groups are essentially typically working on things that could be sort of considered as projects, right? Like for example, um, the Scientific Computing Solutions Group, they work on various things like benchmarking systems when we receive them, but they also work very closely with principal investigators who may have received a federally funded grant um, and to help them optimize their code or to recommend and build um, workflows for various types of complicated data analyses. And so in cases where um, these solutions group, members of the solutions group do that, they usually are actually added to a grant before it's submitted. And so those of you who are in graduate school are probably very familiar with that because you may actually be paid out of a grant, certainly in, in a postdoctoral sort of environment. That's, that's a pretty ordinary sort of uh, scenario where you might be uh, funded through uh, some NIH or National Science Foundation or DOE type grant. So a lot of our solutions groups are involved with that, but they also answer your tickets when our help desk folks can't. So you'll often be pushed up to uh, our level two within this organization, and you begin communicating with someone who often has a really good understanding of what you've done because they've gone through graduate school, have uh, finished their PhD in that subject as well, and, um, and they've been sort of tied to, to help you with um, whatever it is that you're experiencing that isn't working. Um, our two other groups, we have a group called the User Gateway Group. As the name implies, that's sort of your first contact, typically, with MSI. So that's our help desk. 
which you can actually visit live. There are people there from 9 to 4. Um, uh, we also have um, uh, people who are working on the interfaces of our website to try to provide more information to you about your account and about various systems, whether they're up and available and so forth. So our user gateway group is a relatively new group. Um, it's less than a year old, actually. And we're just sort of fleshing that group out. And we're really excited about some of the things that they're doing from the standpoint of what you sort of experience, the user experience that you have when you start using MSI resources. Um, our last group that isn't a solutions group is the advanced systems operations group. And um, as the name implies, uh, these are the individuals who basically make stuff run. I mean, as much as we talk about sort of trying to abstract um, computing and data storage and things like that, it's still metal, right? Like the cloud, it's still metal. <laughs> I mean, there's still systems underneath. Um, uh, the interfaces that we provide, um, those interfaces require people to actually rack, stack, and configure those nodes and it consumes electricity, and it requires air conditioning. All those things happen if you were to go down five floors below us in our data center, um, where most of our compute assets and data storage are actually located. So um, we've got, um, I'll talk a little bit more about those assets as we go on. So that's, that's, our, that, that, that's actually how we're arranged as, as support people. Any, any questions about this as an organization, about MSI as an organization? Just jump in. If you have any questions, you don't have to wait uh, to the end. I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions as we go through. Um, just in general, I think it's important to, to put uh, up front really what our vision is, and that is to simply foster innovation and discovery through advanced research computing. And, and with that, that's a pretty, pretty broad vision but um, that's really what we're here to do. And so we're really interested in, in how um, your use of our systems and your interest in our systems can be advanced uh, toward that vision. A um, little look at who's using what. Um, as I mentioned, computational chemistry is a big user um, of our service units, of our cycles. And that's no surprise, as well as engineering. Um, those are really big consumers of the compute. That's only one facet of sort of looking at our resources, though. There's also data storage. And this picture actually shows that when you look at who's using our data storage, you see that it's much more life science centric. There should be no surprise there, right? Because the life sciences typically are, you know, are a lot of our big data users. They have, you know, data from instrumentation very often that is on the order of gigabytes to terabytes uh, in size, either imagery data uh, or imagery data in the form of sequence analyses. And so, um, so uh, depending on how you look at it, we have a really balanced sort of uh, use case from sort of the traditional uh, uh, material sciences and um, physical sciences uh, to, uh, to the life sciences, which are uh, a, newer, a newer group, in a sense, to, um, uh, to high performance computing. So in addition to these assets that you typically get at from a remote location, we also have some, some actual physical locations, one of which is where you're seated right now. Um, this is our, one of our tutorial classrooms. And uh, it's used actually quite frequently for, for, for tutorials and workshops. Um, we also have um, a laboratory downstairs called um, the LMVL. And it's sort of a joint uh, laboratory used for visualization. And that lab is actually right now in the midst of being uh, upgraded so that we'll have um, a large format 4K projection system <laughs> Uh, that uh, will have a number of really interesting assets, including very high-end uh, video cards for doing sort of um, um, very data-intense uh, visualization. Uh, we're looking at actually creating a direct connection uh, to Masabi, which is our large supercomputer, 
so that we can do some uh, direct visualizations actually using the supercomputing assets to drive those visualizations. Um, in addition, we have labs that are scattered throughout campus. Uh, some of those require special permission to access, um, but, um, but there are also places like um, uh, Cargill, the Cargill building on the uh, St. Paul campus where we also do tutorials for people who are on the St. Paul campus. The second part of the semester we do tutorials out there. All right, and then the main location is here as far as where all of our staff sit. So if you were going to um, actually meet with one of the solutions group members, you'd, you'd come here and their office would be on this floor and you'd arrange some time to actually meet with them. All right, so in a nutshell, what all this means is that MSI provides services, and if I were to define those services to you very quickly in, let's say, my elevator pitch, I could define them sort of on the basis of the five principal things, where the things listed on the, the right, the four things listed on the right, are basically sort of hardware things. These are the assets that you tr traditionally think of with computing. They include batch scheduled computing. That's your traditional HPC where you you know, write a, a command script and you submit that and you walk away and have a cup of coffee while you're getting a bunch of work done on the system. That's only one part of it though. We also have interactive computing and increasingly that's becoming uh, an important asset of ours and something that we're uh, trying to support as a first class service. That's where, you know, in some cases, and I'll demonstrate, you could be running an application that actually looks like it's running on your system but it's actually running on the supercomputer. So that's an, an example of sort of interactive computing. And I'll give you a specific uh, example as we go a little bit further. Then also under, typically under sort of contractual agreements, we do uh, web portal development and database development. Um, this is not a general resource though for everyone to use in most cases. Um, it is used when specifically we engage with a principal investigator at the U who has a grant and we might do the development specifically for that grant. And then last but not least is the data storage side. So these again are all the, the physical assets that really can't operate without the consultant. So um, this is a big part of our, of our portfolio, what we do, and, um, and it's something that I think as you get into things, will increasingly sort of um, be something that you might take advantage of. So what do those assets look like? Um, first of all, we do have machines, and these are big machines. Uh, so Masabi is our most recent purchase, and um, that is sort of the preferred place for logging in, and I'll show you how to do that uh, in a moment. Um, Masabi essentially um, was the replacement of Itasca, Itasca is still running. Um, it was purchased in, in uh, 2010, so it's a bit old now as far as compute resources are concerned, but it still actually is doing a lot of work and is greatly appreciated by our community. We're, uh, we typically rotate systems out about every five years, uh, so we're, we're about two years into Masabi's life, and we're already beginning to collect specifications for the replacement of Masabi. And so what will happen is Itasca will be completely removed and a new system in about three years will replace Itasca entirely and will run both of those systems, Masabi and whatever the new one is concurrently until the new one again goes out. And we just keep that cycle so that there's good continuity with respect to access to computing here at the, at the U. Um, it's a really good way to go. I've been at other universities, again, where there's a big punctuation between you know, having an old system and bringing a new system in, and sometimes there's not a lot to compute or nothing to compute on for a couple of months, and we avoid that by doing this sort of overlapping uh, replacement. Um, it is a big system. Um, it is still a top 500 system two years after it was purchased. So it's um, the 342nd fastest system in the world, um, according to the top 500. And so that includes all sectors um, except, um, except classified. 
And so there are some classified machines, a handful of those in the world that, um, that obviously don't post their results on the top 500. But uh, industry, um, uh, all, all sectors included, we're the 342nd fastest. As far as university-owned systems, when we rolled out Masabi, it was the fifth fastest system. And that's important because there are a lot of systems that are at universities that are big, but they're actually owned by the federal government. And so Stampede, for example, at the University of Texas is, um, is, a, is a federally owned asset and is available to everyone in the US. And so I have an account, for example, on that machine and can do computing there as well. Whereas Masabi is actually owned and operated by the university and therefore we can, we can give all the, or allocate all the cycles to, to you, which is, again, it's very important distinction. So I'm gonna, with that, just any questions that folks have, because now I'm gonna sort of actually show you what does this even look like, a batch scheduled job, um, what does that look like? Any questions before I get into that? Nope, you're all good. Again, this is really, I'm sorry if it's going, if it's slow for some of you who've been using the system. The idea is we'll get through this in an hour and you'll have hopefully a better overview of all these various pieces that are available to you. Then the subsequent tutorials, for example, everything that I demonstrate is going to have actually a specific tutorial specific to it. So, um, so this first example that I'm gonna give is Let's say I want to use that first service that I, that I mentioned. I want to do a batch scheduled type job. The way that I typically do that, and I'll, I'll for everyone's benefit here, um, just back out of it entirely. And so I bring up a, a command line um, uh, prompt. If you're using uh, Windows, then you would use you know, something, something that supports SSH, some terminal program. If you're using Mac, Mac has a built-in terminal program. So you, you, you bring that application up and you're given a prompt that looks like this. So you can type typically ls to see sort of what files are in your home directory where you sit right now. Well, I don't wanna be where I'm at right now. I wanna go to the supercomputer and I wanna launch a big job. The way that I would do that, would I, I would type ssh, my MSI username, which should be the same as your um, University of Minnesota Internet ID, and then I type at um, login.msi.umn.edu, okay? And so that tells me, that gives the fully qualified address to the login node and, um, and my username, and I just hit return. At that point, I'm prompted for a password because I've connected to the system. So I type in my password, which is probably also my U of M password, because those all have been unif unified within the last year. And at this point now, when I type LS, I'm no longer on my laptop, I'm on the supercomputer, and I'm looking at the file system that is distributed across every single node that we have as part of the supercomputer. So I could go to any node on the supercomputer, type LS, and this is what I'm gonna see. And this is my file system, this is the, my directory, my home directory. Good, up to here. People have probably done this, and again, this is, this is an intro, so I'm sorry if it's uh, a repeat for some folks. Um, so once I get onto the system, I really can't do much except see the files that I have. I could use various programs to edit files and so forth. Do you have a question? Um, you can use your you can use your credentials for MSI, but you don't have to follow along interactively if you don't want to. But if you have an MSI username um, and password, you can that'll get you in. So you can use your MSI credentials to do that. All right. So from here, I can't do anything but edit the files. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do another SSH command, but this time to Masabi. So I'm going to log in. To Masabi, all I have to do from here is I don't have to tell it the full address because it knows, the login node knows where you're going just if you say Masabi. So I'll SSH Masabi, it also knows who I am so I can leave that out. I type in my password 
and I'm in. I type ls, of course, what happens? Exact same thing as when I was on the login node. You can think of the login node as sort of what some people call a bastion node. So it's kind of outside with part of it facing the, the, the broad, dangerous world of the internet, right? It, it actually just faces the campus. If you were off campus, you would first need to log on to a VPN, a virtual private network. And there are instructions for how to do that on our website. But if you're off campus, you first have to log into a VPN, which makes you then look like you're on the campus. But if you're already on the campus, then you would do exactly what I just described. So you'd first log in to log in, and then you would go to submit to submit a job. Now, how do I submit a job? Well, I'll give you just a quick example of what that looks like. I'm going to CD for change directory into batch test. And in batch test, I've, I've put a program called Clustyle. And I'm going to go ahead and jump into that directory. And in that directory, I can see, just by the way I use this sort of color coding of files, I can see that I have a binary. So this is my program called Clustyle W2. So I have that program, and I know I can run it in batch mode, because sometimes it takes a long time to do the, I'm, I'm going to do a multiple sequence alignment using this Clustyle program. And sometimes it can take hours. Sometimes it could take days um, to do the alignment. So I don't want to sit around and, and, and watch that happen. So I'm going to submit a big job to, uh, to the supercomputer. And I'm going to do that by creating a file that I'll call Clustyle Run. And I've already created, and I'll show you what it looks like. So I'm going to use a command called uh, less to show you what that looks like. And that's going to bring up this. Can everybody see that OK? I think the text size is pretty good. Is that visible? Um, so a few key points. This is, first of all, what a batch job looks like, a submission script looks like. There's, it's not terribly mysterious. There are lots of examples also on our website of, of these things. And I think this is very close to the sort of introductory batch job uh, um, that you would see on, on, the, um, on our website. So the first thing is it says, I want to, to use, as far as an interpreter, I want to use bash. So the first line is often called the shebang sort of line. And it says, my interpreter in this case is going to be bash. Then I can write some notes in here uh, by hiding them behind uh, pound signs. And then I can write some notes to the scheduler so that the scheduler gets some information about what, how I want to execute this job. So I want to call this job W first of all, so it gets a naming convention. Um, and then the other things are sort of less important. They have to do with, for example, uh, where does the input, where does the output go to, that all these sort of input-output pieces will be bound into a single file. So it puts those things in a single file. And then the, then, then the second to the last one essentially tells it what queue of the many queues that are available to submit to do I want this job submitted, right? So I'm not going to go into the queues here because there's a tutorial that specifically dives into how you can make the best um, out of the queues that we have, the different queues that you can submit to. But I'm going to choose one for small jobs, because this is actually a small job. It's only going to take one processor to accomplish this. And I'm going to ask it to run for, for uh, 30 minutes. And I'm going to ask it to run on one node and on one processor per node. So that's what this, this whole first part tells the scheduler. Uh, I want to do. Then the second thing is just absolutely the same thing that you've seen me done. It's just a command that will run without me typing it, which is I want to CD into my home directory and then into this batch test and into the clustal directory. So that's the first that's the first line. And then the second line says when you get there, run this program, that binary that you saw, Clustal W2. And as its input, um, have this in file, the in file, as sl underscore 12s dot fas, so it's a FASTA file, and make the output called this. Okay, that's all it does. And that's, 
the program has to understand that syntax. That's exactly how I would, I would execute the program if I were running on the command line. So you can test this before you batch submit it by actually you know, executing exactly this command to see if it works. Does that make sense? And that's all. So, so that's all the script does, is it does exactly what you might do sort of interactively, but I've wrapped it in this script, so now I can do, I can submit one of them, or I could submit a hundred of them, depending upon the intensity of the job. To submit them, then I would just type um, qsub is the command uh, to submit a job, uh, and then the name of the file that I want it to read. So in this case, it was uh, clustall um, RUN, hit return, it says okay it's running now and here's the job ID that it's given it and I can issue another command called qstat and without any qualifiers it's just going to show me um, my job. So it's queued up in the small queue, my job with this job number, the name of the job remember I specified in the, in the script is clustallw. That's me. Um, the status of that uh, time used is zero. The status of the job is queued, and it's in the small queue. That's all it says. So I can hit this again, and my prediction is that it'll be complete. Sure enough, it is. So it's complete. So I can then do an ls, and I just overwrote the other files that were in there, and I can see actually that what I started off with is this. So I'll show you the raw file. So, um, so this was the input, you'll remember. So this is a, a file. It's actually got funny line terminations, but uh, it's, there's no alignment that happened. Um, this is the raw file. And now I can actually look at the output file. And this is the fully aligned sequence, and it's aligned based on various parameters, again, that I set up in advance. But this alignment, in some cases, if it were very large and very complicated, could take days. So that saves me a lot of effort. It's one thread, and then it's you know one uh, very sort of simple program, but it could take a long time. And running that on my laptop would just be sort of ridiculous. I could run it on the supercomputer. And likewise, I could run a job that would maybe run over many processors if that job was parallelized. We good with that so far? Basic sort of stuff again. I apologize if you guys are, are more advanced, but the idea again is to give everybody a good chance at seeing how this stuff is sort of comes together. All right, so what else do we have? We also have uh, interactive HPC, and what I want to do is give you uh, a very specific example of what that means. Who here has run uh, in an environment called NICE. You haven't used NICE yet? Cool. Well, NICE is one of our interactive environments. Um, NICE um, uh, can be found very easily by going to uh, NICE, spelled N-I-C-E, dot M-S-I, dot U-M-N, dot E-D-U. So just bring up your web browser and you can go in that way. And then you can type in your user credentials which again should be the same as your UMN internet ID. And what you see is that there are a number of different resources available to you. And so um, for this, I'm gonna s select um, a non-GPU resource um, for the fewest possible hours, just so that hopefully I can get connected to it. And so I click onto that and you can see your session will soon be started. Oops, I accidentally started to. And that's, that's pending. I may just come back to it if it doesn't start up instantly here. I'll close one of those sessions. And so, so this, while it is a high availability resource, you do compete for the resources with other users. So it is a general access facility. Okay, that one's closing. Yes? Uh, 
Well, because it's interactive, it's probably the evening. I meant there actually is some ebb and flow so that, um, you know, it's a lot more busy during the day. Have you found that to be true or have you, oh, you have yeah, the evening and weekend. So, so have you tried to use the nice resource before? Gotcha. Yeah, then, then definitely, uh, um, I think my experience has been that there's a lot of contention uh, during the day, especially in the middle of the semester, um, for the resources. And so this might kind of go on for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, that you can see this is, this t let, let's let this go. And I'm going to show you another way that you can interact. Um, has anyone here heard of Jupyter or Jupyter Hub? OK, so do you write Python or R? Python, right? So it's kind of a preferred environment uh, for running Python and R in particular, but that does support other programming languages. It's also part of our interactive compute environment, and we call it um, uh, nb.msi.umn.edu, as in notebooks. And so you can hit return on that, and then you'll type in, again, your credentials. Same credentials all over one password. You will select what group you're part of. I'm, I'm part of multiple groups, so it gives me this option. And then that brings you to essentially exactly what you would see on your laptop if you installed this yourself. Do you, do you have an installation on your laptop? No, okay. You've used it on a server then. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people use it, either they've installed it on their own notebook, it's very easy to install using something called Anaconda, um, or they actually run it on a departmental server or something like that. And all I have to do at this point is just start her up. Again, I'm gonna have to select a resource. I'm gonna select the smallest re resource and hit spawn. And, and there is contention for this queue as well. Um, so it may not start up instantly. I'll go back and see what's happening with NICE. Oh, good. Well, while, while this is spinning up, oh, it's starting up right now, but I'm gonna go back to NICE because now I've got a full terminal and just show you real quickly uh, what that actually means, what that looks like. Um, so in this case, it, it downloaded um, the necessary components. Um, I just click on that component and it asked me if you, questions because this was the first time on this machine I, I logged in. What you have right now is a desktop running on the supercomputer. So I can actually go in, uh, I can see uh, my home directory, all the files and, and so forth that I, that I saw uh, when I was um, running the batch test. So there's my batch test file in fact, and I could actually run uh, applications that have a graphical component to it. And um, for example, it could be Clustall. So now I could do essentially the same thing as what you saw me do uh, through the command line using, um, using this uh, graphical interface. So I can go back to batch test and I can actually load that FASA file. So there it is, nicely colored, you know, based on what type of nucleotide uh, it's symbolizing. And from there, I can actually go under here and do a complete um, alignment and specify where the output files will be and so forth and hit OK. And I can do this, I'm doing this the same way, I mean, it's the same software, it's the same algorithm, but I'm just doing this through a graphical interface. And now I can see the results slightly differently, just with few more colors and I could even use some of the interactive components here. So that's a pretty handy feature that it sounds like no one here has yet used and you can see how you can do the same analyses um, but interactively under that sort of environment. So is this update going on the actual build computer interface there or is that just like the equivalent analysis you could do with Nice? Yes. Um, so, um, so the way that the code is created here is that there is a graphical um, fork for Clustal and a command line fork, but it's compiled 
based on the same source code, but they do have uh, all, obviously all the hooks for the graphical environment in this case. But the data sets also were the same. It's just sort of a different, different look at it, different way to approach it. All right, so let's see if my Jupyter job, yes, great. So I'm gonna be able to sort of show you um, a quick look at Jupyter. Jupyter's great because it actually sort of builds in a lot of the dependencies that some of your jobs might have. So for example, if you've ever tried to install Python on your machine, you might also have to install SciPy. That's also gonna require NumPy, you know, and it goes on and on. And sometimes it works great, but it doesn't always. And so this interface, going through your web browser, essentially takes some of that um, uh, complexity uh, uh, away. And so I think I have an example notebook here. Uh, that's not a good one, so I'll go back up. So I have an example notebook um, where I just do some analyses uh, using the Jupyter interface. And, and really uh, what I have here are just, um, I guess I've, <laughs> I've used this example notebook to, to change things around, but basically all within this, this single file that I've created is all the sort of code that I need um, to create a, a specific plot is my goal in this case. And I'm just using as is in the same way that you would be if you were writing a Python program, um, these various windows essentially to write my Python code in. And so all of my imports, all of my dependencies, like I mentioned, NumPy, uh, Matplotlib, Matplotlib, and so forth are already um, installed on the system. And I'm actually running this again on one of the supercomputer nodes so I could have code that I could run through the command line or through an interface like this. And this is a new resource that, that a lot of people are starting to use now. Yes? So you storing? Great question. The answer is yes. You're storing it on the supercomputer. So my files, when I refer to um, files here, um, I am actually opening the file um, that is located on the system. In fact, you can see virus, prokaryote, eukaryote file. If we go back to here, I'm referring to these files. And they, and they are located on the supercomputer. So, um, so that's kind of also a nice thing to think about. It's a very good question because you could have some really large data sets that might have been generated on the supercomputer, and now you want to use Matplotlib to actually do some visualization of those. You don't have to download the file. Just open up a Jupyter Notebook, and if you're proficient in, in Python or if you're learning Python, you can use this environment actually to do some visualizations of that output without ever moving the file. You can create a PDF, and you can then point your advisor or your colleagues to the shared file system, and they can actually see the stuff that you actually generated from long um, analyses that may have run. So, so that typically is really helpful, especially so that you're not creating multiple copies of the same output. Does that seem helpful to some folks? I mean, to me, this is, this is a great environment. When you're working collaborative, collaboratively with people, it can get so confusing when you're creating multiple copies of output, and then you're, you know, if you do any sort of manipulation of that output, um, it's hard to sort of keep track of which version is actually the one that you find most interesting or most relevant. So what I showed you there were three means by which you can do, quote, interactive computing on, uh, on MSI resources. Jupyter Hub is one. Um, the other is um, um, NICE, um, and um, actually, I just showed you two, didn't I? Yeah. Right, so the third, I was going to show you one more, um, 
and uh, interactive one, and it's called Galaxy. Um, and so we'll go to galaxy.msi.umn.edu. Is anybody here in the life sciences? Which, which? Right. So. Okay, I know who you're working with. Right. <laughs> there are not too many people who are legally working on cannabis. So, um, so um, yes, so, so an environment like this actually would be really germane to some of the work that you're doing um, because it's really built around, in large part, um, genome analysis tools. And so I could run, and I won't demonstrate for um, to, to save some time, but I could use this same environment to actually upload my data set um, the FASTA sequence data set, and then use this graphical interface um, to, um, to do multiple sequence alignment as well. So this is the third sort of means by which I could interactively analyze uh, data. And, and so that's where I came up with the number three independent of the batch scheduled stuff. All right. Any, just jump in at any point if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going so I can get through some other other stuff in a, in a good amount of time. So, yeah. So, uh, so all three of those are interactive sort of gateways into students that can stay online. And my biggest yep. concern I see with devices, and I've been asked this many devices, is that the administration will limit the license. Oh, Basically because yeah. they're using software that we don't want to buy the license for, but MSI has it. Right? Yep, yep. So that's, those are different machines, actually, that that stuff needs to all be running on. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, that yeah, we do, and we don't really emphasize this because it's an infrastructure that we honestly prefer not to support, and that is the Windows environment. It's not that we, it's not that we, you know, it's just a lot harder for us to scale up in that environment, and it's not really, quite frankly, a supercomputer application. It's a remote desktop yeah. environment, and so that's our... Uh, it's a shared license. Yeah. That's right. So that's our Citrix environment, which is also very much of an interactive asset. And you can definitely use that asset, um, as many people in life sciences and proteomics um, do. Um, and it's, it's something I'm not going to dive into here, though, but it's our Citrix environment. And Citrix, again, is a very common uh, virtual desktop um, uh, infrastructure, VDI. You hear it often under that, or virtual desktop environment, VDI. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, but that's something separate from this. Okay. So even the file system in that case might be separate from, from this. Yes? So um, a Citrix can run those through also the non-Citrix tool. Can you can't always run through Citrix. Run through the tool. Well, there are... There are software packages like Abacus, for example, that have licenses that are both Linux and Windows. And so there are quite a few examples, actually, of where we have multiple licenses for different environments. And that's a really good example of one. Yeah. Yeah, good, qu good questions. Any other, any other questions? All right, so storage. Just a quick overview of storage. Um, most of the time at MSI, you don't have to think about storage at all. You don't have to think about storage because you have a, we have a global file system and it's available to you on all of MSI's assets. It's even available actually in the Citrix environment. And so, um, um, so there are other storage assets though. If you are, for example, using lots and lots of data, then eventually you might look into um, parking some of that data in our in our tier two storage solution, right? So if you if you're not using data very frequently, then uh, tier two is an outstanding um, alternative, and I'll I'll demonstrate in a moment sort of how you can get data onto that um, platform. In addition, uh, we are offering now um, in sort of beta form archival storage, so that um, for those people who definitely aren't going to be using data for a long time, there's an opportunity to put it on tape. And so if you're interested in something like that or that's becoming more of sort of an issue within your lab of how to sort of live within uh, the means that we have, 
and um, but you know not have to buy a bunch of disk drives within your own lab, come and talk to us about that because we, we do offer a number of solutions. The last thing I'll mention is we do have a, uh, a full-blown Hadoop cluster. Um, there are also Spark. Uh, Spark is also running on this cluster, so if people have sort of big data problems and they're curious about uh, how these might sort of stack up against um, a Hadoop or Spark, then we actually have that resource. It's a, it's a um, resource that is not generally available, so you have to submit a ticket first, and then you can get an account, uh, an account on uh, Hadoop. Um, we call the cluster BIG. So, um, there, and there's some documentation on the website about BIG. So, um, those are our storage resources. Storage can be really confusing. We've had people attend this sort of general um, overview of MSI resources, and they're trying to figure out, well, how are you guys different from all the other storage providers on campus? And so this little sort of schematic really tries to put our assets in perspective of the rest of the university assets. Um, OIT, for example, provides um, something that we call Isilon. And so Isilon is the storage solution. Um, that they use, but it's very often sort of mounted on departmental servers and, and what have you. Um, and so um, they're a major uh, storage provider on campus. Um, they also are responsible for Google Drive, which is a great solution when you're creating Word docs and, or Google Docs and things like that. But it's, it obviously has its limitations as far as performance, and that is that you have to transfer everything through a relatively small network connection into this cloud storage provider. Has anyone, does everyone here use Google Drive? Uh, I mean, I love it. I use it like crazy. I use, you know, upwards of 100 terabytes of it, but I'm realistic about what it can do. And so for syn synchronizing certain parts of my hard drive and sort of creative work that I don't want to be lost, it's great because I can also go home where I've got a machine that also syncs against that and I can have everything sort of in one location or virtually sort of looking like it's in one location. It's definitely not a high performance file system though. Um, in addition, we've got depart you probably have departmental workstations and servers that have storage associated with them. The library has something called Drum, which is the data repository for the U of M. That's what the D-R-U-M stands for. And then of course you, you carry around storage like everyone here, almost everyone here has you know, a laptop and, and that's obviously distinct from these other assets. Right here. That's actually Isilon. Yeah, great question. So Active Directory is 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 back-ended by the Isilon storage solution. Block storage is basically if you're running on some of their dedicated virtual machines and stuff like that. All right, so, so what I've tried to do is, and these slides are available online, is so you can look back at them and, and just create sort of this matrix that, that basically says, what are these different storage solutions available to you good for? and sort of lay that out. Right now, if you're working with legally protected data, this would be like clinical data in particular that includes uh, patient information. Uh, there isn't a great platform. Uh, AHC has one, the Academic Health Center, but it's relatively small. We're working right now on, on looking at new ways that we can protect larger data sets that might have uh, patient protected information in them. I want to mention Globus really quickly because getting data into and out of MSI resources can sometimes be a pain. Um, most of the time you can just use your favorite SFTP client um, like Cyberduck or Transit, you know, or some of these tools to, to graphically move from your hard disk onto MSI's file system, the primary file system. But if you need to move resources amongst different university-owned assets, then Globus is really, really a nice tool. And um, I can demonstrate real quickly how it works. Um, so if I, uh, 
Uh, first of all, I, I log in to this interface. So Globus works as a service. So I log in. Here's the cool part is it knows that I'm actually from the University of Minnesota based on where I'm logging in from. Uh, it uses this uh, common credentials scheme so that it actually pushes me back to the university and says, we don't have any data on you, but your university does. If you can convince your university that you are who you say you are, then we'll get a token from them to believe that you are who you are, who you, who you say you are. So I don't have to remember a Globus password because I can log in using my UMN credentials. So I do that. One password, one username, just like MSI. I log in and lo and behold, it now knows who I am because it trusts the University of Minnesota servers, essentially. And now I can actually, um, I can pull up, I think I have some bookmarks. I can pull up um, my home directory. And at this point, I just use my UMN credentials again, log in, and I see my file system. So you'll see, again, batch test. Right. This is exactly what I just um, showed uh, and showed in a couple of different interfaces. And at this point, if I logged in to another university, um, I might be able to do this if I can remember my password at FSU. <laughs> um, Oh, it is. Okay, good deal. So, um, so now I'm logged in to a high-performance file system at Florida State University, um, and I can select files um, in any one of these, uh, you know, on on any one of these systems, and I can I can push data to that to that system, um, and just by using this graphical interface. Now, what's going to happen that's really important that you understand, and I'm sorry, you, you, I'll just write on the board for a second. Uh, hopefully, you can see this, is that it's really important to keep in mind if, if I'm at FSU here and I issue the command to send files over to MSI, it's actually going from uh, MSI over the high-speed networks. I mean, it's going over the high-speed networks from FSU to MSI. What's an important distinction is if you're using an FTP client, it's typically going to come down to your laptop wherever you might be seated over a very slow network connection, all of that data, and then go back up to MSI and not utilize the high-speed network. So you see the difference? It's a, very, it's a very important distinction because if you're collaborating with someone at another university and they want to give you two terabytes of data, the method whereby you actually use, let's say, transit or cyberduck, it's going to take you a lifetime in some cases if you're if you're trying to pull down multiple terabytes. Whereas you can do in in a matter of minutes, actually, on depending on what file systems are at the end, um, a transfer over some of our high-speed networks. So keep that in mind. It may come up where you're actually working with someone. The question to ask them is, do you have a Globus endpoint? If their answer is yes, and you need to move big data between their machine and yours, this is a great solution. We've got lots of people now moving lots of data exactly in this manner. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you just said your research team about moving data with each one platform. Exactly right. It's right within our own system. So yeah, numerous systems like um, the Isilon system is in the process of being sort of lined up so that they have an endpoint. Um, we're actually lining up our tier two storage system also so that it has an endpoint. I think I might be able to get to that. So if I type in, um, we're just about ready to release this. So this is a little bit, here it is, UMN. Tier two, and so let's see if this works. I want to get rid of that. Okay. 
no guarantee that this will work, but it did. Cool. So these are my buckets. These are all the buckets that I own on the S3 system on the tier two data storage. So this is a really good example that you raised where you can actually manage your storage and move it directly from one storage platform onto the next. So I can actually, I'll test this again. This is, this is potentially fragile, um, but I'm gonna just move this output file, let's say, into test one bucket. Okay, so there's nothing in there right now, so I'll move that file in there. So it, the way that this works is that it actually sets up a task. So the transfer as a service sets up a task so that I can walk away from this. I can close the browser, I can turn off the machine, because at this point the service provides the connection. And so um, I'm going to refresh the list and hopefully see a file there, and I do, yeah. So that was a really teeny file, but imagine a terabyte file that you want to push off of your Panassa's storage onto tier two, great solution. Because you can just, you can take tar up or zip up whole directories and move them into the tier two. And that way, you know, if you're publishing a paper, you can pull that back onto Panassas in the same way that I just showed you, if you have to sort of reanalyze it or something like that. Does that make sense? So uh, Globus, this is how you use it. You've seen it live, <laughs> and uh, no, no, uh, no prep or or no uh, no sort of pre-login. So all of that was real time. All right. Any questions so far? Yeah, 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 very good question. It's all queue dependent. So um, uh, there's actually a table um, on our website that if you uh, look at it, actually gives the constraints associated with each queue. In general, there is a 90-day constraint because that's the period of time between downtimes. Actually, it's shorter than that. I'm sorry, it's a, uh, it's, um, I can't remember right now exactly when it is. But there, yeah, we have regular scheduled monthly downtime. So it's, it's, it's a month is the longest that you could run. Um, now, what most people do who have jobs that take a year is that they use software that checkpoints, right? So that you run the job for the maximum length that you can within the, uh, the period of scheduled downtime. And then you simply checkpoint that job. And then when the system comes back up, you have a script that starts it up again. And that way you could run jobs for, for years, as people have done. Not all software in some disciplines is um, enabled uh, to do the checkpointing. Most jobs that run for years, most software does have a means to checkpoint because the expectation that, for example, your machine is gonna run for a year is typically violated, and then it's a hard, hard thing to do. Good question. Yeah, thanks for asking. And also, one of the workshops that's coming up is actually perfect. I mean, this is what you need to get into if you're interested in maximizing the use of the queues. Uh, we'll specifically talk about how to do job submission and all the tricks and what have you to job submission. Highly recommend that everyone here go to that because you're going to spend the whole time sort of figuring out which queues work for you, how to look at at queue availability to fit your job in, and it could be a, it could really help in terms of your overall productivity. All right, last things that I just wanted to sort of point out is that we do do a tremendous amount of dedicated work, um, specifically around um, web interfaces and web portals. Um, this is funded work, so um, so MSI is not just running a bunch of supercomputers, but we're also engaged directly in the research. Um, that people have on campus. In this particular case, we're working with the Food Protection and Defense Institute um, on a, um, uh, essentially a project that tries to look um, and identify uh, potential um, disruptions to our uh, food supply chain. And so we do that in a number of different ways. 
Some of that could be pulling down news articles that are completely unstructured and then essentially creating sort of a data dictionary from that and using natural language processing tools to try to reconstruct you know, various sorts of trends that we see in articles like this or tweets or you know, various news feeds that might indicate that there's been a crisis or that there's been an issue relative to food in particular in a certain part of the world. And so this has been a, a really interesting project. We developed this interface that, that you see that is actually further developed um, for essentially an operator to look at some of these sort of canned analyses and then sort of dig deeper into things that sort of trigger alerts. Um, there are numerous other examples that we work on. Uh, one of the things that I think will probably be more germane to you is that we also uh, support a boatload of software packages. Um, it really, I um, mean, a lot of software is installed on MSI, uh, MSI hardware. Uh, some of that, as you mentioned, is actually licensed and is extremely expensive. We have a huge budget that we, or a huge portion of our budget actually goes into servicing licensed software. Um, yes? Yeah, you can, if you own a piece of software and you want it installed on MSI, what's going to happen is you're going you're gonna to submit a request and say, we own the license, we can transfer the license to you, um, and uh, one of our analysts is going to look at it, and if it can be installed pretty easily, you know, if it, for example, has config file and basically installs on CentOS systems, then we're gonna we're gonna do that, um, and we'll install it for you. If it's a tricky package, and we evaluate that according to how many hours that we think it's gonna take to install this, then we would have a pushback and say, look, we can't install all packages. If you really have to have this installed on MSI resources, then we would have some charge based on how much time it takes us to install it. And so, you know, I uh, I can't remember exactly what the threshold is right now. But obviously, uh, as it exceeds you know, a certain number of hours, then that's where we would need to get some charge back. But that, that's how it works. If it's open source software, you have a couple of options. One, just install it in your home directory. Typically, the binaries are not that large. That's what I did with that clustall package, as you notice. And I actually just compiled it right in my home directory. That's one option. The other option is to uh, ask MSI to install it for you. Um, and the criteria that's used there are, are there other people who need it? <laughs> and if there are other people who need that software package, then we'll install it sort of a level up from your home directory so that other people can access that exact same package. But if, again, the, the sort of criteria that we use to, as to whether or not we do that, in this case is how many other users are using it. And we have so many packages that very often what people find is that they say, can you install this package? And the answer comes back, yes, type this command, it's already actually installed. And so it may, it may be there already, um, just might have a slightly different name. You can see where the software is following that breadcrumb trail. Um, and this again tells you uh, what, I just, what I just said. Um, Let's see, as far as software is concerned, these are some of the restrictions. We do have software packages that are time limited, and that's because um, we just own a limited number of licenses and there's a boatload of people who want to use it. And so in some cases, we actually have signups uh, to use uh, various types of very expensive license software that we support. Um, user services, already really talked about a lot of this information. Um, we provide um, these things, not all of them are free. Um, help desk, consulting, tutorials and workshops, um, classes, I mean, all these things are part of what we do, but things like, for example, code development, those are typically done when we have a, a specific arrangement with um, a principal investigator. We don't, we don't just develop code um, for anyone who says, hey, I'd like this piece of software. Um, we do parallelization, optimization, porting of code, and visualization. These are all things that we are engaged in. 
We do that with um, about 24 consulting staff. These are the services people or the solutions people. The other staff that we have are typically sort of at some other level. They're, they're um, uh, not, not necessarily available for consulting. Uh, we have a, a lot of collaborations. Many of these, as I've already mentioned, are associated with federal grants. We also now have a number of collaborations with private industry in the state of Minnesota. So uh, one big one actually is, is PepsiCo. We work a lot with PepsiCo, which is the food company. It's not the pop or soda. Soda company is they're often known as. Uh, uh, Pepsi represents a, a very small fraction now of, of what the company called PepsiCo actually does. And so they, they have Quaker Oats, uh, Frito-Lay, a number of different sorts of things. And they're really uh, making a big push to make their food uh, better for you, as a lot of the big food companies are, are uh, sort of getting behind that trend. Uh, I've already mentioned this, but I'll just, it bears uh, repeating. Most of our services are actually free to University of Minnesota faculty and their associates, also other academic institutions in the state of Minnesota, for example, McAllister, St. Thomas University. Um, they have accounts on our system. They're using our system. Uh, we host systems that are used in a dedicated fashion for a fee. Um, we also develop software for a fee, and we work with external organizations, as I mentioned. I uh, already mentioned all of this, um, and the eligibility part um, is also sort of related to whether or not you're a faculty member or not. Um, accounts last for one year. Every year you have to renew your account. So we just recently went through this. You've probably got a glimpse of that firsthand, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe it just happened, because actually your PI or the group administrator within the PI group is responsible for renewing. And if you're just a member of that group, then they actually verify that you're still an active user and you probably didn't even know that it happened. Yes? Yes, yeah. Um, so every, every year, the PI or the person who was designated by the PI has to go in, there's an online form and you basically just say, yes, I need this amount of resources, um, um, and these are the people who I still want to be in my group, um, and I do understand the terms of use. You know, literally, th those are the pages you're clicking through. Submit, and if, it's, if you're only asking for 70,000 SUs and 150 gigs, then it's automatically renewed. You'll get a notification usually shortly thereafter. You're good. Oh, no, it doesn't. No, not for that. I mean, for that allocation process, that's all done based on whether you're, uh, um, uh, whether you're a faculty member or not. Yeah, the, the grants stuff come from if you are part of a group who needs dedicated storage, let's say, for example, then you might be charged for that storage, but only if you've requested it. And that's usually, that's actually done in the fiscal year, too, not during the renewals. Mm -hmm. It's, that's a great question. I think actually it's, um, it's a slide right here. So um, if you need uh, between 70 and 280,000, then the criteria that we use is, did you use that much last year? And if the answer is yes, then you're automatically bumped into that group. If you haven't, and this comes up frequently, you're a new faculty member or you're, you've been at it with MSI for years and you, you really haven't used a lot of computing, but you get to, let's say, 69,000 SUs, then you just submit a, um, what is a, a mid-year allocation request. There's a form there. It says, I need more SUs. You click it, and then it says, you're at 70,000, you're probably already, you're probably asking for 280,000, is that what you want? You click submit. And then we get that, we review those weekly, and if you're right up against the boundary, we just move you up to the next one. For the greater than 280,000, we actually have an external review committee 
review those. And so there's about six faculty who look over those applications because when you're using this much computing and more, it's actually adding into the thousands of dollars annually of, of what that compute value is worth, as you can imagine. Just take the node, like I said, and multiply the number of nodes that you would need to run that many jobs, and that's kind of our cost. Data sets, this is also sort of what we look at. So if your, your default allocation is 150 gigs, um, no justification required. Typically for under five terabytes, less justification is required, but you do need some. Between five terabytes and 20 terabytes, I need to update this, um, you would need to demonstrate that at least half of your data is less than one year old. And you would need to do that by not touching your files, <laughs> um, you know, periodically to make them all look like they're less than one year old because we can actually see how that, <laughs> how that happened. So the idea is that for our principal storage, our primary storage system, we want that to be, it's a high performance storage system, so we want you to be actively utilizing that data. And if you're not, we want you to move it on to our tier two. Does that make sense? Help information is available on our web at these URLs. And that's, that's really all I've got, but I'm happy to answer questions. So thanks for, for coming today.